Hi, it's Xiao. Hello, 大家好，这里是小帆船 and welcome to my third art vlog. Yes, I'm going to keep counting. I think it'd be pretty cool if one day I could say, "Hi, welcome to art vlog number one thousand five hundred and sixty-two." I think that'd be quite the accomplishment. But we'll see if I get there. Today's topic is the value of values. Yay pun. Funny. Okay, not not really, but values are very important in art. They're one of the fundamentals of art, and the reason being that they're essential in helping your image to be more readable. I'll get to that in a minute. First, what exactly are values? Well, they're how light or dark something is. So if we look at these photos. That I took of Vancouver, Canada, and we remove all of the color information from them. Essentially, what you're left with are just the values, grayscale. Yeah, that, that's literally what it is. So, values lie on a scale, a value scale. The higher end, giving you white. On the lower end, you have black. And the scale on the bottom, you can see, is a smooth gradient. There's an infinite number of possible values within this scale that can be used, and this is normally what a photograph looks like. A painting, however, is more of a simplification and an interpretation by the artist of what reality is. So, generally speaking, the values within a painting are simplified. And therefore, go by this value scale on top. So, how can values help your painting be more readable? Well, let's let's take a look at my more recent paintings. A few of them. We have the dragon up here on the top left. The character in the bottom left. Some clouds here, and a field. Uh, yeah, okay. There's color information, so you can kind of tell based on the colors as well. But let's let's get rid of the colors, and let's zoom way out. I mean, just based on these tiny, tiny, tiny thumbnails, you can still kind of make out what's going on in these images. And the reason being, the values that are used for the subject within each painting is different from. Whatever it's being surrounded by, and so it draws focus, and the viewer can get a clear understanding of the shape and the form of whatever the heck it is that they're looking at. Right. So this first one you can still see is a dragon looking at something. This one on the bottom is clearly a character. The one on the right, top right, is of clouds. And the one on the bottom right is a field with clouds in the sky and the flowers here on the bottom. So I'm gonna go through next、uh, how I studied values and how I learned to use them. Now, for people who don't know, I went to a very traditional atelier style academy, and the curriculum has stayed the same. For hundreds of years, it's a very traditional school, and the way that they teach technical and the fundamentals of art, I think, speaks to how important values are. Because you always, always start with pencil drawing. Not only does that strengthen your ability to be able to communicate ideas using a very simple tool. It helps you with line control, with line weight, how to hold your pencil properly, edge control, etc. But all that aside, in terms of values, it takes away your use of color. So you are forced to do everything 
in grayscale. They're, they're not colored pencils, they're like just graphite pencils. And the first thing that you have to draw for class are these plaster cast geometric shapes. And I did many, many of these. They're, they're not terribly fun to draw, but they're important. And the reason why they're plaster cast is because it takes away the factor of interpreting local value. Because they're just white. So the only value information on them would be a result of whatever light was being cast. So I spent quite a bit of time sitting there just drawing cubes and cylinders and cones and pyramids etc. And these weird ones that are co combined with like a cone with a cylinder through it. And only at a point where I was comfortable with these basic geometric shapes was I allowed to move on to still lifes. And this is still in pencil. So still lifes is basically anything that's lying around the studio, uh, stuck on a pedestal in the middle of the room with a light cast on it. And these then introduced elements that weren't present in the plaster casts. These introduced local values and uh, different materials that have different reflectivities, like, for example, ceramics are going to behave differently than an apple peel, and they're going to behave differently from a metal spoon, and flowers are going to reflect light differently from, from this plate that it's sitting on. So, from here... I had to also learn how to break down local values, combine them with the light information, and translate all of that into values. And remember, still lifes that are sitting on a pedestal are not in black and white. They're all in color. So part of the challenge is also to see through the color information and extract purely the value information. And here are a couple of examples of some of the early still lifes that I did. These are books and a jar with some tissue. I don't remember what was in the jar. Uh, metal thermos. So different materials. And now I look at these. My line quality is kind of meh. And my edge control was kind of meh as well. But, you know, everything contributes to mileage. And it's interesting as well because when I was drawing these, you're also required to apply perspective. Like, these things are all illustrated in perspective. So, that's another fundamental here that's being taught. And just for f some further background, this isn't my first foray into actual art classes. This is stuff that I did very early on in, I believe it was high school. Um, before that, I was taking art classes, like junior art classes or something, where... I was drawing basic cartoon characters and learning to recognize shape and doing some basic coloring. So I've had a lot of art schooling under my belt. <laughs> anyway, the next step in the atelier training is to actually take a bit of a step backwards. We're going back to plaster casts again, but this time doing human faces. And a lot of these are classical Greek and Roman sculptures, except this this first one here on the left. This thing is the Asaro head. It is a simplified version of the human head into planes. And I had to draw this thing a couple of times to understand how light behaves on the simplified planes of a human face before moving to something that was definitely more human looking. This is actually very useful because it shows you where the highlights are, where the reflected light is, where the shadows should be cast, etc. And these are some of my old plaster cast drawings that I also did in high school. They're alright. I mean, again, everything contributes to mileage, right? So... I guess my training in terms of using values is a bit different from a lot of people who maybe have started 
in digital, you can still do value studies using dig digital media. Definitely important, and there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. This is just how I learned it, and if you're interested in attending an atelier school, you can do so, maybe not during the virus times, but there are schools or there are courses online now available that will teach you these drafting skills and you don't have to physically go to a class. This is pretty fun and I feel like a lot of my traditional training has helped me with my digital art. Mind you, the techniques in traditional are a bit hard to translate into digital, but there are ways to do it. The fundamentals, however, definitely immensely helped. So I'm going to move into a demo. And I'm going to fill this sketch in of a girl uh, using values. I'm going to zoom out a little bit because it's a bit too close for me to work. So uh, my sketches are generally pretty rough. I don't use line art in my paintings. The only time I use line art is in my webtoon. And I use a slightly different approach to that. So I'm not going to cover it here. And this sketch is of a girl standing under a willow tree, and the wispy things around her are the branches. Xiao, why are you so obsessed with trees? I, I like trees. I, I like going out for walks. I like going hiking. It's It sucks that I'm stuck in the house all the time during these virus times. But it is what it is. Gotta stay safe. Okay. So let's get started here. What I'm going to do is create a layer underneath my line art layer or my sketch layer. Use my lasso tool and pick out the shapes. So I'm going to pick the character out first. Again, this doesn't have to be perfect. You can always go back and adjust it later. What's important now is just to fill in the overall shape of this character as quickly as we can. Okay, and so hold Alt to remove parts of your selection, hold Shift to add to the current selection. Okay, now we grab my paint bucket here and go for like a medium value. Now let's add the branches in the foreground. Let's say this lighting situation is a sunny day. She's standing underneath the shade of the tree and the lighting is coming from sort of beyond the branches in the back. Wow, that is stiff. Okay. So let's make uh, the branches in the front have a lower value. They kind of look like seaweed right now, but meh. And any parts that you miss, you can fill in with a brush. And in the back, let's pick out these. I'm going to do this very quickly. Definitely refine it for your paintings. And it's just, yeah, be honest here, it's not my greatest work, but eh, it is what it is. Hopefully you get the point. Part of this is also to have appropriate shapes in your painting as well, but that's a topic for another time, and I'm not going to cover it here because that would take forever. So uh, the color in the back, or the value in the back, I'm going to go with something a little bit lighter. 
And finally, let's do the sky. I'm going to use a gradient here. My gradient tool, deselect. Oh, backwards. So the sky is always, always a gradient. It's never one tone. And it's usually darker on top or darker towards, yeah, darker towards the top, unless it's a region of the sky that's close to the sun or the moon. Anyways. There are some general rules, but the easiest way to learn is still just to do studies. Because there's no substitute for that. So let's add a bit of a gradient to these leaf thingies, or these branches. Now check your values. And the easiest way to do that is to actually just get rid of your line art and then zoom all the way out and see if you can tell what the heck is going on. And I think that's that's pretty good. Like you can tell that there's a character in there that um, she's underneath some kind of a tree, hopefully. And uh, you can definitely tell what's going on. So the the course as you paint the value values within the character are going to change as well because obviously she obviously she can't be one value so what you have to do is be aware of what's going on the entire time so let's say i add some shadows underneath her neck and let's add some shadows here under her hair And then let's make her hair slightly darker. Okay, now let's say I, I add some highlights to her hair, right? And I do this. And then to her shoulders and maybe her chest. Now I zoom out and I get rid of the line art and now when we zoom out we're like oh no we're kind of losing the character to the background <laughs> so go back in and fix it maybe make it darker or maybe you know make the hair even lighter but since she's got dark hair in this iteration I'm just gonna make her hair a little bit darker, add some highlights in there that aren't too close to the background, zoom out some more, and get rid of the line art. Okay, now that reads a lot better. So, that's why this is important. It's, it just helps the viewer understand what's going on in your picture a lot easier. So, okay, maybe we don't like this arrangement. We don't want the light to be coming from the outside. What if this is a magical tree and it's casting a light on the character and it's nighttime? Okay, let's uh, let's use some darker values here for the background. And then let's change these branches to be slightly darker as well. And we'll make the character a lot lighter. Oops. Can't use paint bucket. Okay. So let's take a look. Get rid of the line art. Does that read? Yes, it does. We can still tell that there's a character there. Okay. So let's add a little bit of shading. Okay, let's zoom out again. Take a look. Yeah, still looks still pretty good kind of losing her hair to the branches in the back. So at this point, you can decide either 
you know, maybe maybe her hair is white, or maybe maybe she has really light hair, and we're gonna make her just a lot lighter here, or maybe she has much much darker hair, and we're just gonna make it all dark here and add some highlights. So uh, a lot of it is going to be pausing and staring at your work and doing a lot of value management, quote unquote. That sounds very financy. It's not. It, it literally is sitting there and trying to understand and manage the values within your painting. And if you've ever watched me live stream, you'll notice that I actually pause quite a bit and just stare at my painting for sometimes minutes at a time. I'm not admiring my own handiwork. I'm literally looking for problems and trying to figure out how to solve them. So uh, I think you'll find that a lot of artists do the exact same thing. Is they, they will just sit there, stare at their painting, zoom out, and figure out if there's something wrong and try and fix it. So, hopefully that was helpful for you, and you learned something in terms of how values can help uh, your paintings out to be more readable. You learned something about how I learned values, and maybe you can apply that to your own art journey. You definitely don't have to. I took a bit of the long route, but I felt like it helped quite a bit. But that's just my personal opinion. And, uh, oh yes, another question I get a lot is, but Xiao, how do you know where to put the, ca put the cast shadows and all the reflective light and all that stuff? I'm gonna be honest, a lot of it is from doing studies at first and understanding the why. So, it's understanding why there's a cast shadow in this neck region. It's because her head is protruding away from her neck, and therefore there should be a shadow down here. And why there's a shadow underneath her nose, or why there's a shadow underneath her lip, or around her chin, because that's how the structure of the face is put together. And then a lot of it is also sitting back and reasoning. So let's say, well, her hair is casting shadows on her face, but at the same time, the light is shining down onto her chest and her dress and it's actually bouncing back up onto other surfaces so there's a lot of stuff bouncing around so maybe there's some reflective light down in here or or even underneath her neck here so it, it it's about a combination of studying from life from photos putting all that knowledge that you've gained together and then really analyzing what it is that you're painting. And if all else fails and you have no idea what's going on, just something doesn't look right, find a reference. Just, it's always better to find a reference. There's no shame in referencing. I reference all the time, professionals reference all the time. There's no shame in it. But anyways, uh, thank you for watching. I hope this helped. And until next time, bye.